Greetings students and welcome back to another video on calculus of variations. In this lesson we're going to continue solving our geodesic problems by finding the equation of the geodesic on a sphere. Suppose I have two points A and B located on a sphere which is centered at the origin O. Our goal is to find the path from A to B along the sphere that minimizes the distance between A and B. We can describe the length along the path from A to B using this length functional. And this is the functional we want to minimize by solving this geodesic problem. The length element ds can again be described using the Pythagorean theorem, but this time there's a dz squared in the expression because when we're traversing along a sphere we're technically moving in three dimensions in Cartesian space. But here's something else we need to do. Since we're moving along a sphere we need to write everything in terms of spherical coordinates. We can express x, y, and z in terms of the radial distance rho, the angle relative to the positive x-axis that I'll call theta, and the angle relative to the positive z-axis that I'll call phi. Now since we're on the surface of the sphere, the radial distance rho is just a constant capital R, where capital R is the radius of the sphere. So what we'll do is we'll replace all the rows by capital R. Our length differential ds is in terms of dx, dy, and dz, but since we're using spherical coordinates, we need to convert these differentials dx, dy, and dz and write them in terms of the differentials in spherical coordinates, like d theta and d phi. And in order to do this conversion, we need to use the chain rule. The differential d rho, by the way, is just zero since rho is a constant. And once we use the formulas for x, y, and z and plug in these partial derivatives, here's what we'll end up with. Let's plug all this into the expression for ds. There's going to be a bunch of algebra involved, but ultimately we can show using the sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1 identity that in spherical coordinates we can write ds as r times d phi times the square root of sine squared phi times d theta by d phi squared plus 1. Now let's plug this into our functional L, and here's what we'll end up with. The phi A and phi B, by the way, are the angular coordinates of points A and B respectively. Again, we can apply the Euler-Lagrange equation here. This time we're integrating a function of phi theta and theta prime, where theta prime is d theta by d phi. So in this case, the Euler-Lagrange equation would be the partial of f with respect to theta, minus the derivative with respect to phi of partial f partial theta prime equals zero. Now the function f doesn't contain theta, so we can just cancel out this first partial derivative. In addition, since the first term was canceled out, what we can do is we can integrate both sides of the equation with respect to phi. On the right hand side we'll just have a constant that I'll call k, since the integral of zero is just a constant, and on the left we'll have the partial of f with respect to theta prime. But we already know the expression for f up here, so we can evaluate the partial of f with respect to theta prime, which would just be theta prime times sine squared phi over the square root of sine squared phi times theta prime squared plus 1. And after performing some simplifying algebra, we'll finally end up with this differential equation involving theta and phi. d theta by d phi equals k over sine phi times the square root of sine squared phi minus k squared. By the way, if you want to go through the algebra step by step, I recommend pausing the video and having a closer look. Anyway, let's separate variables and integrate this differential equation with respect to phi. On the left we'll just have theta, and on the right we'll have the integral of this monstrously difficult expression in phi. There's an important fact to note here, which is that the constant k is less than 1. Why? Well, because if its magnitude were greater than 1, then sine squared can't go above 1, so the square root would be imaginary. And that wouldn't make any sense, since the derivative must be real, it can't be imaginary over some part of the domain. So that's why k has to be less than 1, because the square root has to stay real. So we've established that k is less than 1, but how do we solve this integral? Well, we can use a substitution, where we'll let some dummy variable u equal k times the cotangent of phi, in that case, du will just be negative k times the cosecant squared of phi d phi. Now before we replace all the phi's by u, we need to express sine phi in terms of u, since sine phi appears in our integral. And that can be done just by using a right triangle. Since cotangent phi is u over k, that means sine phi is just k over the square root of k squared plus u squared. So sine squared would just be k squared over k squared plus u squared. 
So now everything in phi is in terms of u, which means we can go ahead and plug all of this into our integral. And once we simplify everything, here's what we'll get. Theta equals the negative integral of du over the square root of 1 minus k squared minus u squared. Now here comes the punchline. Because k is less than 1, as we said earlier, 1 minus k squared will be a positive number. And since 1 minus k squared is a positive number, we can write it as another positive number, alpha squared. And so we'll be integrating the negative of 1 over the square root of alpha squared minus u squared with respect to u. You can easily find the result of this integral just from looking at an integration table. However, if you think that looking at an integration table is an affront to your existence as a chad, you can do another trig substitution in which you'll let u equal cosine of some other dummy variable psi and evaluate the resulting integral. In either case, you'll find that theta is the inverse cosine or the arc cosine of u over alpha plus some integration constant that I'll call theta naught. But we also have to put everything back in terms of phi since u was just an intermediate variable. Because u was k times the cotangent of phi, we can finally write the equation of the geodesic on the sphere as theta minus theta naught equals arc cosine of beta times cotangent of phi. Beta and theta naught, by the way, are integration constants that we have to solve for by using the boundary conditions from the initial and final point, the a and the b. I won't bother doing that since that's just some unnecessary algebra which won't really add much to your knowledge. So now we've finally found the equation of a geodesic on a sphere. However, if you stare at this equation and try to imagine what it means intuitively, you won't really get anywhere because, quite frankly, the arc cosine of a cotangent is a little too complicated to understand intuitively. At least with the geodesic on a plane, we could look at the answer and say, oh, that's just a straight line. But when we look at the geodesic on a sphere, we can't really say what this equation means just by looking at it. Or can we? Let's take a quick detour first. Suppose I took my sphere again, you know, the same one we found the geodesic on. The center of the sphere is the origin O. And suppose that in addition to the sphere, I had a plane which passed through the center of the sphere at O. You can imagine that if you have this plane and you pass it through the center of the sphere at O, the intersection of this plane and the surface of the sphere is going to be a circle. In fact, this circle is pretty special. It's called the great circle. A great circle is just the intersection of a sphere and a plane passing through its center. Let's find the equation representing this great circle. Since the great circle is the intersection of the sphere with the plane passing through the center at the origin, we can find the equation of the great circle by starting out with the equation of the plane passing through the origin. And you might already know that the equation of a plane passing through the origin is just ax plus by plus cz equals zero. Now since we're also on the sphere's surface, we need to express this x, y, and z in spherical coordinates with the radial distance held constant at r, kind of like what we did earlier on when writing the distance element ds in spherical coordinates. And once we do this conversion to spherical coordinates, we can plug in the resulting expressions back into the equation of the plane. The capital R's are going to cancel, and if we shift this third term to the right and divide both sides by sine phi, here's what we'll end up with. Now this expression on the left can be rewritten using trigonometric identities as the square root of a squared plus b squared times the cosine of theta minus theta naught, where theta naught is just the arctan of b over a. Note that b over a isn't referring to the points b and a, it's referring to the constants b and a that are found in the equation of the plane. Now what we can do is divide by the square root of a squared plus b squared and take the arc cosine of both sides and we'll find that theta minus theta naught equals arc cosine of beta times cotangent of phi where beta equals negative c over the square root of a squared plus b squared. Interestingly enough, this equation of the great circle exactly matches the form of the sphere geodesic equation that we found by using calculus of variations and the Euler-Lagrange equation. What does that mean about the geodesic on a sphere? Well, it means that the geodesic on a sphere is just a segment or arc on the great circle. If I wanted to find the path of shortest distance between two points on a sphere, I should use the segment or arc on the great circle connecting those two points. Hopefully all of this should be clear, but if you have any questions, let me know in the comments. 
Anyway, that should do it for the lecture. I'd like to finish off by thanking the following patrons for donating at the $5 level or higher. And if you enjoyed this video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.